frente que eu quero passar Pois o samba está animado now this is where the competition really came to life. Five flat out stages through the French Alps covering a distance of about 130 kilometers. These roads separated the men from the boys. Hundreds of spectators would line the route all the way from the base of the valley up to the top of the mountain. It was fast, furious and extremely dangerous. One slip could cost you chunks of bodywork or worse, your life. And quickest of them all, the Mini Cooper of Hopkirk and Lytton, number 37. Now these are the sort of roads, these are typical special stage stuff. Well, these would be fast special stages. My goodness, the first time we've had... You do still have it, don't you? Yeah. No? I'm hell of more. <laughs> Looking back, Paddy, would you say that that victory in 64 and the Mini was the, the pivotal moment in your entire life? Well, yes, I think so. I mean, I was uh, a professional rally driver, which had already changed my life, but the Monty win secured that very much and probably changed it further. And people, you know, I realized I could use the name <coughs> to advantage. 40 years on and the memory of his Monty victory is still obviously very sweet. But one thing has been bothering me. Just how much does Paddy Hopkirk still love his driving? This is what the Monte Carlo rally was all about. The blind corners, hairpin bends, the sheer vertical drops only inches away. <laughs> and I'm enjoying every second of his exquisite mini masterclass. As we reach the summit, heavy snow adds even more jeopardy to the journey, yet Paddy doesn't bat an eyelid. So that's the end of another long day. You know, I've had worse. The spectacular alpine scenery had been well worth eight days cooped up with Mr H. Back in 64, they had no time to appreciate the sights. The foot was firmly flat to the floor. This is the Col de Torini, probably the most famous and definitely the most treacherous stage on the Monte Carlo Rally. It's a steep climb to the summit of this mountain pass, almost 5,000 feet above sea level. And it was here at this tricky double apex bend that whole... It was the decade that transformed the country into the hippest nation on the planet. From mods and rockers to Carnaby Street fashion. The 60s were swinging and Britain was the place to be. Beatlemania, Mary Quant and a revolutionary mini skirt may have shaken the world. But in the midst of all this, there was a car that was a star too. We were preoccupied in the design in getting good road holding and stability, both for safety reasons and to give the driver more pleasure. Baby, the Mini was a classic British invention. Peter Sellers, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were all proud owners. Queen Elizabeth II was even seen behind its wheel. But one event really catapulted the Mini to its worldwide fame, and it started miles from British shores. This is the city of Minsk in Belarus, formerly part of the Soviet Union. And it was here in this rather chilly spot that a swashbuckling young Irishman began an odyssey which was to become one of the most talked about events in British motorsporting history. The year, 1964, the event, the Monte Carlo Rally. And the driver in question? Well, he was behind the wheel of a rather famous red and white Mini Cooper. Belfast-born Paddy Hopkirk was just 31 years old when he and co-driver Henry Lydon steered the Mini to victory at what was probably the world's most famous motorsport event. The rally started in different cities throughout Europe and covered over 2,000 miles before drivers converged in the French city of Reims to begin the special stages in the Alps. After four days on the road, the climax took place on the streets of Monte Carlo. Spectators and press gathered in their thousands to watch competitors tackle the final stage on the famous Grand Prix circuit. In 1964 was the first time the rally had started in Russia. 
And for the boys in car number 37, this was their first taste of life behind the Iron Curtain. It was a victory that completely revolutionised the Mini, put it firmly onto the global stage. Paddy Hopkirk achieved the seemingly unachievable. Now, 40 years later, I'm here in Minsk to start retracing that monumental journey which covered many thousands of miles across Europe. And my co-driver, well, none other than the legend himself, <laughs> Mr. H. How are you? Good evening. <laughs> Listen, it's chilly in this place. Why couldn't you have started somewhere a bit more exotic? Uh, a night, a good idea, a good idea. So this fantastic journey you've dragged me all the way out to Minsk to, to recreate. Run me through it very quickly. Well, we went from here down to the Polish border, through Poland, down into Warsaw, uh, and then down into Czech Republic, with Czechoslovakia then, across into Germany, France, then common route from Rance straight down through the mountains to Monte Carlo. That's a long way. What's it like being back in Minsk? It's blooming chilly. It was not as cold as it was then. It was minus 39, I think, in the evening. Certainly minus 27 during minus the day. Minus 39. All right, Paddy, but where's 33 EJB, the legendary car you won the rally in in 64? Well, I think that's a priceless relic now. It's in the Heritage Museum in Gaiden in England. Uh -huh. And they certainly weren't going to let us bring that back here, I don't think. Well, that is a shame. But it does mean that, well, we're not doing the journey in that thing either. Before yeah. I tell you what we are going to do the journey in, which has air conditioning, I'm glad to say, mm, and a heater, <laughs> uh, I want you to take me around some of the old stomping grounds. Some of the, yeah. You've got some good you're stories, on, haven't you? Right, OK. Paddy arrived in Minsk three days before the start of the rally. Time enough to explore the Forbidden City and for this enterprising young Ulsterman to try his luck in the black market. So what exactly was he up to? Is this bringing back any memories? I can't believe it. It's same hotel, but lit up now. What brought you to this kitchen in 1964? Well, we, we, uh, we heard that the Russians were gagging for nylon stockings, and we brought some over from England. And when we got here, we came into the kitchen because we heard we could do a deal with the chef. We could swap these nylons, you see, for some beluga number one caviar. That sounds like a fair deal. So when you track them down, what happened then? Well, we did the deal here, and I got a huge tin of beluga number one, took it out, smuggled it out, hoping to sell it in Monte Carlo for a lot of money, but when we won the rally, we actually had a big caviar party and ate it instead. So you just ate the whole lot? Yeah. And caviar wasn't the only delicacy on the menu. Party-loving Paddy also recalls a night out at a Russian circus with a group of roller skating girls from Essex. They came here and uh, they made a big fuss of us inside. And They treat um, you like superstars when oh, you arrive in town, oh, yeah? Well, you see, it was the first time Russia, or Minsk, had ever, Russia had ever been a starting point in the Monte Carlo rally. And uh, so Minsk did make a big excitement about it and they put the spotlight on us. So we were in the third row when Ernest McMillan from Ulster was there. And uh, then the girls, the three girls from the hotel who were doing the roller skating act, so they said any volunteers from the audience, and Ernest was a real guy. He was in there, and so they were whirling him around on the skates. <laughs> Speaking of which, we need to get our skates on, hit the road. We have a few miles today. I think it's about time I introduced this car to you as well. Right, okay. It's got one or two features I'm particularly looking forward to trying out. <laughs> so that's Minsk. The women are very pretty, though they never smile. It's so cold my extremities are making a bid for freedom, and it's the only place I've ever been that has caesarean salad on the menu. I'm certainly ready to hit the road. Make your new home for the next week or so. New Mini. Okay. It's got a heater and it's got four wheels, and I think that's what we need. But remind me, 1964, how long did it take you to do the, do the whole journey? We did it in uh, four, four days and three nights. Four days and three nights. We're not going to be anywhere near that pace. We'll do it slightly more leisurely fashion, but we have a few surprises along the way. In the meantime, I'm freezing. We've brought our love back to Russia, and now let's take it out again. Two hundred and ninety-nine cars started the rally that year, with just twenty-eight departing from Minsk. A tall, nervous being behind the Iron Curtain. I mean, it was the height of the Cold War, after all. Well, you were always uh, nervous about the unexpected. You know that they might just say to hell with the rally and block the road, or uh, you know, and you couldn't communicate uh, language-wise, what have you. They just do things very differently from the West, so it was, you know, it was very sinister. So who was who was the favourite in '64? The Ford Falcons or Ford Falcons? Definitely yeah. the favourite. And of course, Ford spent a lot of money uh, preparing. The, the, the other teams were actually spending a lot more money than we were. Mercedes were 
Gaggy to win it as well. Everybody was. It was very important to win that rally because it was front page news and it sold motor cars. Tell me a bit about Henry Lydon then. Oh dear, Henry was great. He was a very professional co-driver and... He wore good glasses. Uh, yeah, he wore, he's got a beer bottle sort of <laughs> bottom on his own and glasses were so thick but he was very competent. He was a lovely man. Fast left. 50. Fast right. He also did a lot of driving. I mean, on the easier sections of the way, the road sections of the way down, you know, I was able to get quite a lot of sleep so I could stay fresh for the final special stages from the, the run down from Minsk. You know. I'm sure. How do you think we're going to get on, all right? Well, I'm sure we'll have stressful moments, and that's when you find out uh, what men are made of. The mark of the man. I'm sure it'll be very good. That'll be a bit of optimism then. Doesn't last long though. So much for retracing a monumental journey. It's already turned out to be more monumental than we could have predicted. We're only about four hours outside Minsk and behind me is the first Belarusian border checkpoint. It took us about five hours to get through that. That brought us into this holding area because over there is the Polish border checkpoint. We got in here about three o'clock this morning. Everybody's feeling a bit tired. We've been stuck here for six hours. Talk about uncertainty and the Cold War. It just seems like 40 years on, things are still decidedly chilly. So we're barely underway and already we're on first name terms with sleep deprivation. We just sat in that queue for 10 hours trying to get out of uh, Belarus and get into Poland. It's actually worse in 2004 than it was in 1964. Absolutely, and I mean, we were one of many. I mean, it wasn't as if there's anything wrong with our documentation or the car or paper. It was just gross incompetence and the fact that more people have got over the border. Mm. Paddy, you grew, you grew up a bit kind of obsessed with, I mean, you were particularly into the Monte Carlo rally, weren't you? What was the, the personal background to your kind of interest in the rally? Well, it, it was the one to win. I had done a few, so I knew what to expect, really. And when did you, do, when did you first do the Monte? What year? I think 57. I did 13 in all. Yes, yeah, so oh, this must have been about my what? My eighth or ninth Monte, I think. Eighth, maybe seventh, eighth. So Mon the Monte was the jewel in the motorsport crown, really, wasn't it? Um, I think you have events like the, the, the well, the Monaco Grand Prix is is very famous. The Le Mans 24 Hours is very famous, and the Monte Carlo Rally. I would say those are probably the three kind of blue ribboned motorsport events. The thing was, the rallying was front page news, and it it was the fact that everybody just thought the idea of driving car for three or four days through the night, ice and snow, the challenge of the mountains, the weather, the countries, the it, it was an adventure, you know. You know, you set the clock as you left the control point and you knew you had 500 kilometers to do in 500 minutes. Right. And, uh, but you didn't hang around and what you did was you drove rather rapidly to make to build up time in case anything went wrong. Yeah, you if you did stop and you said, oh, we've got an hour in hand or something, that was the time you suddenly got a lorry overturned or a level cross. Uh, down. Um, I mean, certain your journey was uncertain about, like our border crossing. We didn't know we were going to be held up for eight or nine hours at the border. It was always like that in those days. And the Monte Carlo rally wasn't just for the boys and their toys. So the women, the women rally drivers in the in the 60s were, they were they weren't just there making up the numbers, were they? Or they weren't just there because it was good publicity. They were actually seriously good drivers as well. They? They, they well, they were good. Did they ever beat you? Uh, were you ever beaten by a woman, Paddy? Uh, <laughs> you were, weren't you? Uh, I think Pat Moss beat me once in an event. But uh, no, I think in general, I mean, it's a bit like Formula One. It's more of a man's sport. Because stamina or...? We're just superior, really, I suppose, at these sort of things. <laughs> uh. I think the post bag is, is starting to bulge with letters from irate feminists, Paddy. <laughs> We were already feeling a little weary and still had a gruelling eight-hour drive ahead that day. 